Breathe in, breathe out. I've heard it before, as a mantra to assist focus. There is apparently something about breathing that really seems to help people with that. Perhaps it's the intentional stepping away from the distractions of the world to focus entirely on oneself, particularly the aspects which are so commonly taken for granted. Something like that, anyway. I can only speculate, because I find the practice horribly distracting. I seem to focus far better when I don't breathe at all. After all, pulling mana out from myself doesn't involve my body in the slightest. I don't know if I can exercise my soul in the same way I exercise my body, but it stands to reason that the more I practice pulling out that inner energy, the better I'll become at it. This is much more exciting, much more natural than most training I have to do. Training my talent has always been a pain in the ass because I'm usually afraid messing with animancy will be detectable by the wrong people. Theodora can certainly see when I'm using more complicated forms of animancy, even moving souls in or out of a body, so it just doesn't feel safe to use in this city. This, however, she can't see. This isn't even animancy, but it's still part of me and what I am, something that feels right to use freely. Filling my soul with power then expelling it so that it annihilates that stupid all-pervasive mana that I can't even use just puts a smile on my face. I want to bring more of my mana into the world. I pull the power inward, then I push it outward. In and out. Ha, huh, maybe I can use this to help focus instead of breathing. If nothing else, it's a great way to make efficient use of my time as I walk back to the Hunter's Guild. I can more or less navigate the city without even thinking at this point, so a bit of meditation shouldn't be a problem. I look inside myself, watching power move as I pull it through the channels in my soul, letting it fill and soothe me. One channel and one channel alone pulls the mana in from beyond my immediate self, going further than any other part of me in the direction with no name. I trace it slowly backwards, pushing my senses against the current, looking for where all my power comes from. Thump thump. The line of power is long and narrow. Too long, impossibly long. I realize that if I try to observe it by sliding my vision across the entire expanse of its presence, I will never, ever reach the end. Like a ring wrapped around my body, I can never see all of it simply by rotating my head. I cannot travel to the end of something which goes forever. But I am not limited to such paltry ways of sensing. Thump thump. Every single soul in my range is known to me. Their positions, their movements, their songs and colors and vibrations and feelings. I ignore as much as I can, because it tends to be too much. For the first time in a long time, however, I no longer feel that. Here, everything is simply me. There's no overload of information, even when I view the entirety of an infinite distance. Some part of me already knows everything there is to see here. Thump. Thump. So just like that, I behold the end. The source of everything I am. A vast and beautiful sea of power and potential. Formless, yet seeking form, the torrent deep within scrambles desperately through the minuscule channel, a mass of incomprehensible power paradoxically too weak to send any more of itself through. Thump. How laughable that I consider myself hatched. I'm free from one prison yet still struggling with the bars of another. I tug at this vast blue ocean of my trapped self, pulling and shaping it. It moves to my will as naturally as can be, because of course it does. This is what I've always been part of myself I've always had. I move it with the same instinct that moves my tendrils, I see it as easily as I see with my eye. But even with all of it here, able to be shaped however I choose, I don't have the slightest idea of what to do with it. Like a giant mound of clay, sitting untouched in front of an uninspired artist, I feel the fullness of myself yet I fail to know what any of it should be. Thump. That thought is more than a little frustrating. I really don't know what this means, do I? thump. It's beautiful, I know that much, but what am I supposed to do with it all? I suppose I can use it to cast spells, and hopefully to disrupt the spells of others, but so what? Th. Perhaps things will be clearer when I am more fully myself. This pathetic channel through which I pull mana feels more like a wall. It can be wider. It needs to be. I need to pull myself into the war. Thwack. My attention is smashed back into the physical as I find myself suddenly face first in the solid dirt of the road. My lungs gasp desperately for a breath, inhaling dust and detritus only to cough it all back out again and try again. A sharp pain and wet feeling in my nose indicates that it's damaged, possibly broken. I roll over onto my back, 
clutching my face and rapidly attempting to sit up and try and figure out what just attacked me. Immediately, an unrelenting wave of light-headedness forces me back to the dirt. I finally get some air into my lungs, checking for threats with my soul sense only to find the people around me all seem more worried than hostile. Hey, um, are you alright? One of the people around me asks. A few deep breaths later, I find myself able to answer. What happened? I ask, hand slowly letting go of my spear. Um, I don't know. You were just walking around and then you suddenly fell over. Did you trip? Did I trip? No, I don't think I did. Actually, given the burning feeling in my lungs, I might have taken my focus a little bit too seriously. I think. I forgot to breathe. I'm fine, thank you, I mumble, embarrassed. Waiting a short while to catch my breath, I slowly stand up and resume my walk to the guild, face red. Okay, maybe that's a little too much focus. How long had I been walking without breathing? The rest of all that. I don't have any idea how to process that. I'm some kind of big, blue mana mass in addition to everything else. I look down at my tiny hands, clenching and unclenching them. I hate this stupid body. How did I end up in such a pathetic vessel? Whatever. No sense dwelling on what I can't change. I'll just focus on drawing that mana for now, I think. And breathing. Best not to pass out again. At least my walk is almost over. The guild pops into my senses, a cacophony of familiar and powerful souls that always whets my appetite a little. Not that I have any intention of eating my comrades, but it is what it is. The feeling puts me in a better mood. It's refreshing. The ache of Angeline's death still pulses inside me, but I no longer feel so helpless, so angry. I can do this. I have friends and family and a way forward. The receptionist looks up and waves to me when I enter the guild. Vita, there you are, she says. You're needed for a mission. Have you seen Penelope? Ugh, that figures. Well, I guess I can't complain. There's no better way to get stronger than the forest. Yeah, I have, I answer. Want me to go get her? I don't know when she'll drop by on her own. She gives me a once-over. How about you drop by the medical ward real fast? You look like you just lost a fight with a runaway wagon. I blink. Oh, right. Between the cut side of my face and my possibly broken nose, I'm probably a bit of a bloody mess. I just kinda forgot about the pain, but getting it healed is probably a good idea. I nod and make my way towards the healers as instructed. Claretto and the guy who feels like roots in soil are both in the room, along with the broken soul Fulvia and a myriad of other patients. Soil soul is asleep, but Claretta sings clearly and crisply, a wordless and beautiful tune that starts sealing up the cut in the side of my face as soon as I enter the room. My nose, however, just starts hurting more. Ow. I yelp, holding my face. Claretta glances at me and stops singing, her slow exhalations betraying a deep and full-bodied exhaustion. Vita, right? If that hurts you probably have something broken. The spell is complex enough to try to set it, but it's faster to do so manually. May I see your nose? I nod, approaching and bending down a little so the wheelchair-bound Claretta can get a closer look. The deeply tanned-skinned and dark-haired woman stares at my face with complete dispassion, arm moving up as if to do something for a moment before she grimaces and returns it to her side. She still has no hands or feet, though the beginning of wrists and ankles seem to be starting to form. Hopefully she'll finish healing soon. Jeremy. Claretta snaps. Wake up for a second, I need someone with fingers. A comically large pile of blankets in the corner starts to move the soil-sold man emerging and blearily blinking the sleep out of his eyes. Mup, mup. He mumbles, yawning as he makes his way over to me. Jeez. What wall did you piss off? Do I seriously look that bad? Can you just fix it or whatever? I grumble awkwardly. I need to go grab Penelope. He shrugs, grabbing my forehead with one hand and snapping my nose back into place with the other. Another gout of blood gushes out for a moment before he stops it with a spell, the pain quickly vanishing. There you go, he yawns. Tell Penelope I said hi. You need anything else, Claretta? No, she answers blandly. Rest well, Jeremy. He nods, waves, and returns to collapse inside his fortress of fluff. The biomancers here must be getting run pretty ragged, still. I should probably head out and let them work. 
but I can't help but find my attention drawn to Fulvia's damaged soul. I stop by her bed before departing, trying to determine how fast she's been healing, it's really not much. If I couldn't look at the soul down at a ridiculously detailed level, it wouldn't look like she was healing at all. I check around with my soul sense, trying to determine if anyone is paying much attention to me. Only Claretta seems to care, she's not currently looking at me so I pull out a shard of myself and crush it, sprinkling the raw soul energy over Fulvia's spirit. The reaction is immediate. Her soul pulls in the power almost exactly like my revenants do. Fulvia doesn't feel dead, though. Perhaps this is just how damaged souls react. Either way, the shard dust heals her considerably. I can probably just fix her. It feels like a wretched joke to be put in charge of her, Claretta says, causing me to jump a little. A series of bars jutting out the sides of her wheelchair allow her to move around a bit even without hands, and she's managed to sneak up on me with them. I was just looking out for her. Bah, souls are distracting. Unknowing or uncaring about my surprise, Claretta simply continues to talk. She's certainly not going to want to see my face if she wakes up, the crippled Biomancer -er says, an utterly humorless smile on her lips. Yet they commended me. Can you believe it? I just about had to threaten the higher-ups to stop them from giving me a fucking medal. I barely know this woman, and I don't know why she's talking to me about this. Maybe because I helped rescue her. It's odd to be in a position where others respect me. It's one thing to be respected because of mind control, it's a very different and very strange feeling to have done something to earn it. Why is that? I ask. She laughs, a sound full of despair. Her musical soul still tears at itself, roiling in unceasing hatred. Well, they said it's unprecedented for a team to survive in the forest for months on end. They're just so fucking proud of me for keeping her alive against all odds. Heroic, I think was the word used. What a fucking joke. I glance down at her, trying to decide if I should respond to that. I've been told I'm not exactly the best person for sympathy or advice in situations like these. It doesn't look like I need to say anything, thankfully. She's not looking at me, eyes locked on the unconscious face of her teammate. She ate us, Claretta continues. Over and over. Because I let her, I enabled her. I knew that she knew I was the reason her meals never went away. So she ate Fulvia instead of me. She would bite my friend's arms off, and I would regrow them because if I did, maybe she wouldn't come for me next. It's not your intentions being deemed as heroic, it's your results, I say. That's how it works. You did save her, in the end. I did, Claretto agrees. Even though she begged me to let her die. But a hero? I was a coward. I was afraid of death and afraid of being alone. That's the only reason why she's alive. Maybe she'll recover, maybe she can live a normal life after all this. But I don't get to take credit for that. I shouldn't even get to see it. I say nothing, once again unsure how to respond. Some nobles in a mining town got their arms and legs bitten off, Claretta says suddenly. Probably a monster, they say. But nobody can find it, so I hear your team is getting sent out. I shrug. Makes sense to me. I knew I was going on a mission already. It's her, Claretta insists, eyes wide in my direction but not seeing me at all. It's that child. That thing. I know it is. You have to kill her this time. Please. She's going to be even more dangerous than last time. She'll keep getting smarter, keep getting stronger. You have to kill it now. She's not the only one getting more dangerous, I say. We'll be ready this time. Claretta nods firmly. With a tendril, I pull out another two shards, judging them to likely be enough. I'm a bit leery of using my soul like this, considering how much work I go through to get this power in the first place, but I smash them anyway and sprinkle them on Fulvia's shattered soul. They'll just grow back when I eat. A tense thirty seconds or so pass, and then the woman finally starts to stir. Her soul is still a total mess, but it doesn't need to be fully intact to function and I don't want to waste any more shards than I have to on this. A look of absolute horror creeps up Claretta's face as she watches her former teammate squirm slightly on the cot. She doesn't quite wake up yet, but she probably will soon. It's enough to enrapture the biomancer. Taking advantage of her distraction, I quickly excuse myself from the medical ward and more importantly, the conversation. I quickly head back to the immortality lab, practicing my mana control on the way. 
Strolling downstairs, I'm disappointed to find that Vitamin does not jump into my arms from above as she usually does. Instead, she's lying on a table, Margaret standing over her and drawing tattoos on her skin. Hey, guys. I say. Hi mum. Vitamin chirps back happily. Don't move, Margaret snaps at her. Hello, Vita. I'm afraid I've got to steal Penelope, I announce. We've got a guild job. Uck, what terrible timing, Penelope complains, emerging from one of the side rooms. Nothing for it, I suppose. Let's. Her words cut off as she looks at me, said look quickly turning into a glare. After a moment she rushes forward and grabs my face by the chin, pulling me closer. Ah woo! I grunt in surprise. Her stare is intense and unblinking, and behind her gaze I feel her thoughts moving a mile a minute. Your eyes. Penelope mutters. They didn't used to be blue. My eyes. Are blue? How are the pupils? I ask immediately. Pupils? Penelope mutters, pulling my face in closer. They seem normal. Perhaps slightly vertically ovoid, but not enough that anyone will notice. Why? What do you know about this? My soul is a big blue eye with a vertical slit pupil, I explain. So if my real eyes are becoming blue too, that's my first guess as to what's happening. My eyes used to be green, right? Do you think people will notice? Yes and yes, Penelope grumbles. Probably not most people, but the team will. Your family too, but you can just tell them the truth. I mean, I don't know the truth. I've been practicing pulling mana out a lot, and my mana is blue. Sort of. It feels blue in the same way souls feel like they have colors, anyway. That's about the only super relevant thing I did since you last saw me, unless getting into a fight to the death counts. Penelope blinks incredulously at me, then sighs. Of course you mentioned that as an afterthought. Explains the blood on your face, I suppose. Who was your unlucky victim? Nah, don't worry. That's all my blood. How reassuring, Penelope answers flatly. I shall sleep soundly tonight. Anyway, if the team asks you can blame it on me. It's not like they can get any more insufferable about the modifications you told them I was making. Uck, I'm sorry. Are they bothering you about that? I genuinely did not realize they would make such a big deal about it. It's fine, Penelope sighs, waving me off, and not something I ever expected an apology for. Still, I am an expert at ignoring stupid, ignorant opinions. It isn't a major issue. Now, other than your recent death battle, are there any other shocking revelations you'd like to unveil before you forget? I think for a moment. Is there anything I've been meaning to tell Penelope but forgot about? The souls inside your lobotomized rats are all wrong. They don't grow anymore. They still function like souls, and they still seem to be involved in controlling the body, but they've become stagnant. Penelope's eyes go wide. Oh. Oh, my goodness. So there is a link? Soul growth. Yeah, I confirm. I've been thinking about it for a while. The Mist Watcher puts souls in us, but we don't need them to live. They grow bigger as we grow, and it just eats them when we die. We're like a fucking farm. Penelope frowns, tapping her chin. That checks out, I suppose. All the more reason to never die. Though to be fair, it's not as if we don't get anything out of the deal. I'm not sure how one would channel mana without a soul. I guess that makes sense, but whole Misty still seems like an asshole to me. Hmm. What else? There are some other things I haven't told her, right? Oh yeah, also when I focused really hard on channeling mana I entered a seemingly infinite expanse from where I apparently pull it all, and then I fell over because I forgot to breathe. W.H. And after nearly killing me Capita heavily implied that her gang is trying to assassinate the king. The king? Wait, your fight was with. Also, a High Templar walked up to me and said that the Inquisitors are coming. Penelope stares at me. I stare back. Is that all? She asks. Are you done? I think about that for a moment, sucking on the inside of my cheek. Penelope crosses her arms, tapping her foot. Yes, I conclude. I'm pretty sure that's all of it, at least for now. She lets out a huff. Okay, then we. Oh. Right. I interrupt. I fixed Fulvia's soul. Well, mostly. Heavily damaged souls seem to absorb raw spirit dust the same way that revenants do. Penelope takes a deep breath in, letting it out slowly. Okay. She says, 
doing her best to sound only slightly exasperated. Well, that's all very interesting, but we should probably be getting back to the guild. The Inquisition is going to be bad news. I was afraid of that, I grumble, following after her as she walks towards the exit. Bye, Mum. Vitamin pulls out. I said quit moving. Margaret snaps. Bye, you guys. Good luck while I'm gone. I respond, waving at them both. So what's the Inquisition's deal? While you shouldn't go around saying this to anyone, it's an open secret that the Inquisition is the church's animancy branch. Not, ostensibly, for any sort of nefarious purposes, however. As you may know, at least a small modicum of animancy is necessary for detecting animancy. It's an amusing conundrum. Animancy is against the law, but in order to be even remotely capable of enforcing the law, animancy must be used. I scowl. So at the very least, these guys are going to have the ability to see souls? I ask. At the very least, Penelope agrees. They're not supposed to be capable of much else, but I wouldn't be overly surprised if they are. Power like yours is a bit too tempting. You are going to need to avoid them entirely either way, that much is certain. Thankfully, there are exceptionally few inquisitors. A bit over a decade and a half ago, that entire branch of the Templars was gutted when the High Inquisitor at the time was found guilty of, shall we say loosely interpreting the doctrine on animancy. Over half the organization was compromised, and the loss of personnel and reputation is something they've yet to recover from. And how am I going to avoid them? They're looking for me, aren't they? I ask. You're the scout, Penelope dismisses. You managed to avoid half the monsters in the forest, so you figure it out. They have no official capacity to investigate yet, which means if the Inquisitors are being sent it's because they're hoping to catch you in the act. They may not be able to run an official inquiry, but they can bypass most of the bureaucracy we're tying them up with if an Inquisitor personally witnesses you performing animancy. You have more than just your own soul in your body, and that probably counts, so you need to make sure you are never seen. I nod glumly. This. This might make saving all the souls inside me a little more difficult. Let's try to hurry up on this immortality thing, I sigh. Penelope chuckles dryly, locking up the lab as we exit. Well, it's a good thing you said so, because before now I was planning on taking things as slow as. A beeping noise suddenly cuts her off, causing her to scowl and fish around her collarbone. Penelope? Lord Erebus's voice asks from the necklace when she pulls it out. Johan, Penelope grumbles in answer, weaving a silence bubble around us. What do you need? Penelope. There you are. You weren't answering. I've been horribly worried. I told you already, Johan, my experiments are too delicate to be letting rogue mana signatures invade my lab. I won't get calls when I'm working. What do you need? Well, would you believe that one of my highest profile suppliers has invited us to have a meal with? No, Johan. Penelope snaps immediately. You know I hate those things. I know, but he's quite the family man and I feel it would be somewhat of a faux pas for me to show up without my fiancé. I'm sorry Penelope, but you know how delicate these things are. I'm being called to the Hunter's Guild, Johan. I won't even be in the city. I'm sure your supplier will understand. A mission? Penelope, but your hand isn't healed yet. And the Hunters lately have been dying by the dozens, you can't. I can't. What? Penelope hisses into her necklace. What I can't do is sit around and eat fancy dinners with rich old fools while my city is in shambles and my country is under siege. I am a Vesuvius. I slaughter Vulcan's enemies and uplift its kings. Do not presume to tell me that parading around as your accessory is more important than how I choose to use my time. Penelope is red in the face by the end of her tirade hand clenched like she would crush the metal bead at the end of the necklace if she was able. Lord Erebus is silent for a good while after that, to the point I almost think he's ended the communication. Is that? Is that what you think I've been doing? He answers eventually. Penelope, I, you've barely spoken to me since you got that research lab. You got injured on your last mission and you didn't tell me. And who says I have to tell you? She demands. No one, Penelope. But why aren't you? Is it not reasonable for me to be worried about that? I love you, Penelope. I just want to see you from time to time. She sighs, some of the anger deflating out of her. I'm sorry, Johan. I know you do. Now just. Isn't a good time. 
but I will work on keeping you better informed. Okay? A sigh is heard from the other end. All right. Be safe. Of course I will, Johan. I can't be going and getting myself killed before I'm immune to it. Oh, and you may wish to know that the broken Drokens have implied plans to use Elk the King while attempting to recruit a certain member of my team. You think you can use that to our advantage? That's... Hmm. Yes, probably. I'll see what I can find. Thank you, Penelope. Goodbye, Johan. She tucks the necklace back into her shirt and sighs, seeming suddenly exhausted. Um, you okay? I ask. Penelope chuckles, shaking her head as we resume our journey back to the Hunter's Guild. You're a lot like him, you know, she says. Very. Focused. Though while Johan sees people as a series of tasks to accomplish, you tend to not see people at all. I scowl, confused and offended. That's a weird way to respond to me asking if you're okay, I grumble. I'm trying my best. She smiles, squeezing my shoulder with a still-growing hand. Thank you, she says. Somehow, I like being one of the people you try for. You joke about it, but... It feels like you're the only person who understands me and still actually wants to be around. I tilt my head. Um, you're welcome. I hedge. Why wouldn't I want to be around you? In addition to... All of the prior reasons I have given you, Johan and I are using you in a scheme that will hopefully corrode the political power of the Templars enough to loosen their control on the metal trade, Penelope says. It's been going on more or less since you met him, but I declined to mention anything until now. I nod. Less power for Templars sounds good to me. Okay, I say. Neat. Penelope laughs. You're not even surprised, are you? Or angry? You made me promise to tell you things like this and I kept it a secret and you're not even angry? I shrug. You told me now. So, that's progress. Why would I be angry? You're not gonna hurt me or my family, so anything you do is fine. She laughs some more, shaking her head. See? This is what I mean. You seem like a fool, but you just have. Your own personal logic. And it's beautiful. I don't have to worry about what you'll think of me. I really can just tell you anything. I can speak my mind. So why don't you? I ask. She stops walking, staring towards me for a moment. Then she shudders. Habit, I suppose. Do you ever? Another pause as she gathers her thoughts. I let her, saying nothing. When I was young, I would kill things for fun, Penelope manages eventually. My talent developed quite early, and, well, I was like a child with a new toy. Insects, at first. But it escalated. Rapidly. The sight of watching something fall apart from the inside out was, is, beautiful to me. But when I showed that to my parents, well, they were disgusted. Of course they were, really. They thought they were raising a watcher damned serial killer. They said they loved me, of course, but, even if that was true, even though they did everything they could for me, it was in service to what they wanted me to be. Not what I was, because they hated that. Feared it. Even a child could tell they did. My grandfather was. Different, but not much better. He saw opportunity in me, the chance to continue the true lords of Vesuvius. I was more or less raised by biomancy tutors from then on, and. Well, my parents never complained about me being too busy to be around. She huffs, pulling at one of the loopy swirls of hair on the side of her head. You don't really understand any of this, do you? She asks. Parents, social pressure, obligations. Your life never had these things. No, I agree honestly. I don't really get it. But I can tell it hurts you. She swallows, nodding slowly. All right. Well, most of that doesn't really matter anyway. I was taught to be a healer and a proper lady. I admit to liking some of that. Magic is beautiful. Solving problems, discovering new spells, advancing knowledge. I am glad I was taught those things. But every single other aspect of myself I have to hide. I knew, at the Hunter's Guild, that I would be found out. That I would be hated. That my guise as the beautiful and intelligent Third Lady Vesuvius would collapse and reveal a person underneath that just wants to watch a creature's skin boil and pop as it screams in agony. But you found out, and you don't care. Worse. This is the part you understand. Even if my whole background is nonsense to you. This you get, don't you? 
a grin forms on my lips. The only thing more satisfying than watching Revenants scramble to fulfill my orders is the feeling of a life sliding down my throat and dissolving into raw power, I tell her. And it is so horribly infuriating that I know I'll end up regretting it if I just do that to everyone we meet. She grins back, slightly at first but growing wider and wider as she speaks. Right? She agrees. Why can't I just kidnap everyone I don't like and use them to figure out how many plagues I can incubate in a single person before they ultimately expire? Yeah, so, it turns out people get whiny about human experimentation, I say shrugging. Who knew? Uck, but why? Penelope groans. How am I supposed to figure out how a spell affects a human without using humans? Rats only go so far. We could skip so much wasted time and effort by skipping to human trials. Yeah. Well, I bet I could solve our animancy problems really easily if I could just bring an army of revenants to deal with Capita and the Inquisition. We're trying to cure death. Why is that bad? It turns out people get whiny when you try to cure death, too, Penelope complains. Be it immortality or undeath or anything, massive swathes of morons will cry no, you can't, death is a part of life for all these reasons I made up. It's wrong to prevent death and definitely not the ultimate goal of all medicine. You overstep your bounds, wah wah wah. We both burst into laughter, a comfortable and joyful moment of shared frustration finally let out. I don't know if I've ever felt her this relaxed before. Things sure would be easier if we could just kill the people who thought like that, Penelope sighs. But alas, that would be wrong. Yep, I agree, nodding glumly. That would be wrong. Fun to think about, but... Really, it would make me feel like shit. Indeed, Penelope confirms. I often wonder if I'm a psychopath, so it's nice to remind myself once in a while that I probably would feel terrible if I did that. Probably? I ask, raising an eyebrow. She shrugs. Probably. We both giggle a little at that, recognizing it for both the joke and the fear it is. And so we go to slay monsters, Penelope intones, lest we become monsters ourselves and also because they are delicious, I add. And also that, Penelope snorts, assuming you are an uncouth gremlin whose appetite defies all reason and sense. I need to teach you the meat-treating spell, if only so you'll stop bothering me about it. I gasp, jumping in front of her. Would you? Oh, that would be amazing. Of course I will, she scoffs. We can start. Well, actually, you don't suffer mana backlash so I suppose we can start today. I'll teach you on the trip. I jump forward and hug her tightly. Best. Friend. Ever. I cheer. Meat treating spell. Yes. I will never be hungry again. Never. Um. Yes, Penelope mumbles, squirming uncomfortably under my iron grip. Her soul starts playing all sorts of rapid, chaotic notes, so I give it a hug too. Eep. She squeaks, in one of the most amazingly unpenelope like sounds I have ever heard. W what are you doing? Soul hug, I inform her simply, looking up at her amusingly red face. I'm not normally much of a hugger, but for some people I have to make an exception. Penelope is one of those people, now. Still, I have mercy on her, eventually giving my friend one last squeeze before releasing her so we can restart our trip to the guild. To my endless amusement, Penelope's face stays a bit red the entire way. I have no idea how to handle the things she's currently feeling, though. Maybe the hug wasn't the best plan. 